We are here today to uh, talk to you about one of our grant opportunities that the Pennsylvania State Archives backs, which is called the Historical and Archival Records Care Grant. Um, and we, for short, we call that HARC. And so um, sometimes we end up speaking government speak and breaking it down to the acronym. So I wanted to share with you what we were talking about when we said HARC. Um, this is uh, a grant that we offer on a yearly basis, but it's a two cycle funding. And um, my information is down in the corner. Um, please don't worry about properly pronouncing any of it. I answer to anything. But uh, once again, I'm Natasha Margolis. Um, you can reach me at nmargolis at pa.gov. And then my phone number is 717-705-1676. And um, I'm a newly taking over this position. Josh Stallman, who is with us today, has been running the HART grant since 2018. This is the sixth cycle. So this is uh, exciting that we've gotten this far and had this amount of success. And to see you all here today even gives me greater hope that uh, we're going to have some really interesting applicants and projects coming out of this. So uh, let me move on then. All right. And uh, so today I want to tell you what our agenda is. Um, we're going to talk about the program overall. We're going to give you eligibility requirements. And we're going to talk about the application and the selection process. We'll discuss the evaluation criteria. Uh, we'll give you some hints for pulling together a competitive application. And we'll kind of give you some ideas of expectations if you are funded. Um, a lot of this content is on our website in more detail, so you'll have that to refer to. We have um, at the bottom of our website, if you keep scrolling, um, there's also additional resources that we won't be discussing today, but might help you with your application. And uh, since we'll be talking to this large group of people today, this will be about the grant process in general. If you have questions about specific projects, um, items that you want to discuss or specific questions regarding your institution, please contact me and we can talk about those at the at a, a later date. But this is just a general overview. I want to give you kind of a good feeling for what this grant is for, with how the process takes place. So um, you can think about this. Um, you won't be surprised. And the most important thing you need to know that the application cycle, you can go online and you can start applying now. That opened up May 1st and the applications are due in um, August 1st by 11.59 that evening. Until that time, you can work on this grant online. It is an online grant application process. So, so this webinar does not cover using the grant system itself. Uh, unfortunately, um, we are not in control of the e-grant system. And if you run into any further complications, um, we have on our website and in this, um, this slide today, the customer support center that you may need to contact if you have any application problems. Um, we can help you with the content, but not the actual application itself. And often they change it up on us. So maybe we don't even know what it looks like on your side. So speaking to the help desk would be the best way to handle those issues. Um, we'll take breaks throughout this webinar for questions, but we'll go through like some chunks of information. Please feel free to type any questions you may have in the chat section at any time that you have them and then we'll address them when we break for the next section so um, if we can as i mentioned if you have specific questions about your grant your organization or or something that is not really for the whole group to discuss you can schedule meetings with me. Um, we can have email conversations or talk on the phone. I am your primary contact for this grant. And this webinar, is, as we mentioned, is being recorded. It's gonna show up on the PHMC's YouTube channel. And we have the general address for that. But obviously, since we're experiencing this webinar right now, we can't give you the exact address to go to for this webinar. So let's get started. Um, just so you know, some of the initials and um, organizations we are. So we're part of the Pennsylvania Historical and Museum Commission. And that's PHMC that is the main site for our web and grant information. 
And this organization has um, several components to it. The Pennsylvania State Archives is one. The State Historic Preservation Office is another. Historic Site and Museums is the third. And finally, the State Museum of Pennsylvania makes up the fourth component of PHMC. Um, let's talk specifically about the Pennsylvania State Archives. So you'll look the uh, picture of the large gray slab with the three tiny holes on the left is where we currently are this week, speaking to you from a building from the 1960s. But as we progress to the beginning of June, um, I may be speaking to you from the right-hand side. Um, right, We were wanting to give you the most accurate picture possible, and we thought that our rendering picture of where we're going to have light and no more concrete and uh, parking and a whole new location. So uh, you'll have to understand that while you are applying for this grant, I may not be a uh, predictable in either location. My computer is my phone, so I will be able to be in contact with you and answer your questions, um, but there may be a slight delay if I'm stuck in an elevator somewhere uh, helping movers, but uh, please feel free to just think the happy thoughts about the right-hand side picture and what you're working with. We're in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania. If you haven't visited us, I would wait until um, we are officially open. We will have free parking. Can I say that again? We will have free parking um, even for visitors and to come and just view the, the new architectural landscape and the reading room is, is going to be phenomenal. So um, this is the organization that primarily runs the HART grant. And this grant has been running since 2018. From 2018 to 2022, we've had 308 applications. We've awarded 147 grants. And over these last five cycles, we have averaged around $175,000 total available each year for grants. Um, this amount is tentative right now. Uh, we cannot give you the exact amount that will be available this cycle. But, and then also I've put our webpage at the bottom and we'll put that in the chat later. Um, this is just how you reach the web page regarding this specific grant. If you go through the PHMC website and you go through the grants um, part, we're actually called the Records Care Grant, despite the fact of our longer name that really describes what we support. So we've been um, growing successfully and the application pool has been growing and also the diversity and the a uh, level of uh, interest of the applicants has been um, increasing over time. So we're going to talk about some eligibility and some examples of projects today. It may not be what you're doing, though, and just because it's not a list doesn't mean that it shouldn't be on the list. We just can't imagine. We're hoping that you can imagine what future um, grant cycles may produce for this. So I just want to talk about eligibility. So in general, we support um, applicants who are from colleges and universities, historical societies, libraries, public and private, museums with archives and records management responsibilities, historical records repositories whose primary mission is the preservation of historical records to make them available to the public, museums and historic sites that are owned and operated by independent nonprofit organizations, Museums and historic sites that are owned by the Pennsylvania Historical and Museum Commission are eligible if they are operated by an independent nonprofit organization. Also other historical organizations that are open to the public with consistent hours, county governments, municipalities, school districts, and organizations with the missions to help to care for collections not necessarily their own. So some of the eligibility requirements must be located in Pennsylvania, uh, must be a nonprofit. We've decided to let you tell us what type of nonprofit you are, um, have a tax exempt status or be an entity of local government. You must be incorporated and in existence for two years prior to the submission of the grant application. And we encourage any of you who want to, to become um, Department of State Bureau of Charitable Organizations. Um, you can obtain information from them 
via this antiquated post box number of 8723 in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania. They also have a web page now that you can access if you're interested in looking to this status. So um, also some more eligibility requirements. Um, we also uh, require that maybe your statewide elected official and government associations, like the Pennsylvania State Association of Township Supervisors, Pennsylvania Prothonotaries, and Clerks of Court Associations, or that you are individual subunits, offices within a county government, or a special collections division within a university library, or tax exempt organizations like a college or a university. And you may apply for grants if you function as a discrete unit within the parent organization. So a subunit um, that is part of a larger organization will be deemed eligible to apply for a HART grant if the unit has administrative autonomy for its operations. The unit has a fully segregated and itemized operating budget within that of the parent organization and or the unit is able to separately and distinctly fulfill all the eligibility and application requirements as defined in the guidelines. Um, just to give you a clearer idea of who this grant is really not intended for is the museums and historic sites operated by the Pennsylvania Historical and Museum Commission. As we mentioned in a previous screen, if you're an associate group of PHMC sites, you may apply as a partner in a collaborative grant as long as the lead applicant is not affiliated with PHMC. Um, museums and historic sites that are operated by state or federal government agencies, except through an associate or management group, state government entities, federal government entities, and most importantly, we do not give grants to individuals. So let's take a break right now. And if there's any questions you have about eligibility or ineligibility, or just how darn beautiful our new building is, please type them into the chat and uh, we can discuss those. So I see that we have several things posted, the information for the YouTube channel, the HARC grant announcement, and the web page. And I don't, and we are getting some really great comments now about our new building. And um, that's wonderful. Um, if we don't have any comments about, or questions about this section, let's move on. So um, there are two categories of support for historical record care projects and for local government projects. And these don't necessarily are, have to be distinct from each other, but it's easier to talk about them in terms, especially if you are one entity or of the other entity. So funding may be requested for surveying, inventorying, preserving, arranging, and describing historical records relevant to Pennsylvania. Funding may also be requested for reformatting or the purchase of supplies and equipment. And we thought we'd give you some examples here. This is not exclusive, but it gives you some idea of what other people have done with the grant and what the uh, panel reviewers have approved for funding. So projects that address statewide needs that build partnerships and networks to support collection care and accessibility. Projects that digitize historical records to reduce handling and thereby preserve the original materials and to make them available publicly online for free. Um, we have an example through the PA Power Library, uh, how to make your collections available online, and our digitization guidelines um, that are attached to the website will give you further information about how to prepare those online, as well as to um, contact the PA Power Library and get your material in there. Projects to ensure the preservation and use of valuable archival and historical manuscripts including cartographic, pictorial, audiovisual, and machine readable records that are not published. Um, also, we support the purchase of preservation supplies, such as acid-free cartons, folders, and boxes to protect your records. Uh, we have been supporting the reformatting of deteriorating historical records. And I know a lot of you have things that are probably not in the best of shape and you wanna keep them 
either in the condition that they are and prevent them from deteriorating further. And also you wanna make a usable copy for people to access. Um, we support inventorying and survey projects. A lot of you who are uh, understaffed and have way too many other things to do have not had quite the amount of time you would like to really get in there and see what you have and survey this. And so this grant gives you the opportunity to take the time with resources to figure out what you have, um, the conditions that they're in, and maybe what you could do with them. We support the arrangement and description of archival records or historical manuscripts. We support programs for the education and training of archivists, records managers, and manuscript curators to care for collections. Um, we also support historical records preservation assessments that may address storage and exhibition of materials, environmental controls, building security, collections conditions, and conservation treatment reports. Um, basically, we're saying that you can hire someone who has the expertise to tell you how to care for your collections, because we do not expect all of you to be trained archivists and know how to handle this in your own unique scenarios. Um, we also handle institutional needs assessments that focus on professional standards and requirements related to the administration of historical records with specific recommendations to correct deficiencies in the care of collections. And also importantly, we help people with emergency and disaster mitigation and action projects. Um, under the local government care projects that we have supported in the past, we have supported county projects that demonstrate the successful implementation of PDFA storage, which is a, a archival format digital document for permanent records and offices that adhere to county records committee policies and guidelines. Um, we've also supported projects that ensure the preservation and use of historically valuable local government records, including cartographic, pictorial, audiovisual and electronic records, and we support the inventory and survey projects designed to provide planning reports in support of the establishment of local government archives, record programs, and facilities. So if you do not currently have an archive, um, we support you looking into and getting advice on how to set up an archive for your organization. Fortunately, I would like to stress what are ineligible activities, um, just so that you understand this is focused on providing historical and archival record support and not really um, handling other aspects of things that you might think would be needed. So the most important thing is that works of art, textiles, artifacts, and museum objects are not eligible items to be supported by this grant. Artifacts um, for archivists are like three-dimensional objects. We handle documents, we handle photographs, um, but these are things that we do not support the funding. So if you have a piano that is in bad shape, I would suggest that maybe you go to the uh, PHMC grant website and see if there is another way to fund repairing and preserving this three-dimensional object of a piano for your project. We do not support endowments, prizes, or awards. We do not give you general operating support money. Um, we do not provide capital improvement project money. Uh, we do not provide money for lobbying or any expenses for entertainment. Um, we also wanna emphasize that we will not pay for existing part-time staff or full-time staff positions. And this includes hiring part-time staff during their non-working hours. We have not supported projects that have been initiated prior to the date of this award. And we also do not um, support projects that have a specific religious purpose or promote religious dogma. We do not support any product that is not publicly available except where prohibited by law. Any projects that involve published or non-original materials, including library books and newspapers, even though are frequently thought of as optimal for um, what this grant could cover. We're instead wanting you to focus on what is considered to be original, non-published archival historical records. We have had some projects that work with newspapers, but I, if you are considering this in your project, I would suggest that you reach out directly to me so that we can talk about this because newspapers are published at a larger level and you know that 
there's lovely sites now like newspapers.com um, where these things may be made available and you may be duplicating your efforts um, that someone else has already done. Also, we do not um, support records or office management projects that do not relate to the normal archival functions or goals, such as projects for creating new filing storage or retrieval systems for active non-permanent office files. Essentially, we are asking you to apply for preserving and taking care of and making available your historical records and not your day-to-day -day records that you're using to keep your organization going. Some additional considerations um, that we wanted you to know about are for digitization projects only, applicants must demonstrate within their project descriptions that they have or will meet certain criteria before receiving consideration for funding. Um, for all digitization projects placed in like the PA Power Library, applicants may request funding up to two years of PA Power Library dues. And once again, I'm encouraging you to contact me um, as the grant manager with any questions. This is my email address, nmargolis at pa.gov to talk about any aspect of your proposed project. If you wanna talk to uh, me just to just bounce some ideas off me, to, to get a, oh, this sounds like something we would support, or maybe even just openly for the first time, start verbally talking about what you might be including in your application, please contact me. For all grant projects, members of PHMEC staff may perform site visits and audits throughout the grant period to monitor projects, progress and adherence to goals and methods described in the application. All applications should describe how projects will be sustained after grant funding ends, and the grant funding cycle is for two years. The application should clearly describe the desired outcomes of the grant and explain how the outcomes will be measured in quantitative terms whenever possible. And we ask that if you've submitted a grant application, if there's any changes that you are making to your grant project, including budget, project scope, and timeline, when you receive this grant or you're still waiting to hear back about it, you need to submit this 30 days in advance for us for approval. So if there are any changes that need to be made, we need to be made well and aware of them in uh, as far ahead of time as you may know. So let's stop here. I know that was a lot to take in. And so any questions regarding availability or what is or is not ineligible for these grant applications? So, oh, go ahead. I was gonna say, uh, one of our questions is about hiring brand new part-time staff for funding for paid internships. This is something that we fund all, all the time. So we are asking to not for you not to pay people who currently work for you, but to bring in other people to your organization. So this is definitely a good way to handle it. Um, another question we have, so prothonotory and clerk of courts would be eligible despite their records not being public. Since having them public would be prohibited by law. That is a very good and tricky question. Yeah, Natasha, I'll, I'll, I'll jump in on that. I, I think um, there's a couple ways to look at that. Uh, I think one of the things that uh, is, is a requirement for the grant is to have the records publicly available. So uh, if you have things that have various restrictions for whatever reason, um, again, I think uh, a lot of times those records actually are going to be publicly accessible. Um, there's there's the instance where you have to make the case for the historical significance of the records, whether they're uh, minutes of, of commissions or, or meetings or otherwise, or um, you know some sort of docket books or whatever the case might be. Uh, again, those records at the end of the day should be publicly available. Thank you, Josh. Is there any other questions you would like to ask at this stage? I did see I did see also Natasha Autumn. Um, Clintock asked a question uh, about the exemption for funding for operating support, including indirect administrative support. Um, to be perfectly honest, Autumn, I would have to verify that offline with you. Uh, you can reach out to Natasha or I uh, on, on the back end of this, but I, I think generally speaking in, in the spirit of the grant, uh, the intention is, again, these are very small grants intended to provide funding for um, direct work on archival collections and materials and, and records and so forth. 
but if you want to reach out to us again offline, we'd be glad to look into that further. That's not a question that's actually come up in the past. And I know uh, with, with a lot of larger grants, there are, um, you know, allowances for, for indirect administrative support and, and other indirect costs. So uh, again, I'd, I'd have to look into that and verify. I don't want to give that information. So please feel free to, to ask us offline. All right. Thank you, Josh. Um, and thank you, everyone, for asking your questions. These are good for us to hear as well and to think about. So there's two levels of funding. Um, you could be a single organization applying up to and including $5,000. There's no match required any longer for these grants. So it would be $5,000 outright. Um, you may ap apply for any amount up to that. So don't feel like you have to pack in unnecessary things to get the grant. Um, just to get it to 5,000. Um, and we also have been supporting collaborative grants where organizations can apply jointly for up to 15,000. So in this scenario, it would include two organizations applying jointly would be able to apply for up to 10,000 and three organizations applying collaboratively, collaboratively for up to 15,000 with no match required. But there is a requirement that you have provided a collaborative agreement that you upload into the grant system. We do not have currently um, a template for that, but what we need you to state in the collaborative agreement is what each entity that is part of the collaboration will be doing, what its roles will be, that you're not just adding a name to get more money, but that there's and some division of tasks and roles which would require you to have the more money to carry out your projects. So that's something that you can also speak with me about offline. Um, like I said, we don't have a memorandum of understanding or a template for this, but we are we are happy to give advice and to help applicants with this process. We would like you to have your project as fully funded as you need it. And so this is part of our job as well. So to give you some idea about the application process, uh, right now, the application is live online, and you have until August 1st, 2023, by 11.59 p.m. I hope that it you will not be submitting this at 11.58, trying to type in the rest of the things that you do. Since this is an online application project, you may want to write things in advance in Word documents and cut and paste to put into the grant system. I will let you know it is a little clunkily. It's not as pretty as it could be, and um, there are specific blocks where information need to be included. So it's not like you have this wonderful free-flowing grant narrative that covers it all, but when we see it on our end, it looks like you have this wonderful free-flowing grant narrative. Um, you'll be given 5,000 character limits for certain sections. I would advise you to give us as much information as possible and as a former university professor, I'm gonna tell you the same advice I always gave my students. Explain what you are doing in the greatest amount of detail that you can um, so that we and the panelists who are going to be reviewing your grants know. So you can't make any assumptions that we know your organization, that we know your records. Um, please explain everything to us, like telling us, the type of records or the condition of the records or the historical value of the records, giving us information and filling out all parts of the grant application process besides those that are required, help us to better know your project, to get as excited about your project as you are and to give, you, um, give us more reason to fund you. So uh, never leave anything blank is what I told my students. Even if it seems like the dullest statement you've ever written, uh, try not to leave any part of this application blank because we'll be talking about this in a couple minutes, what the criteria are for this. And there's a checklist and there's a point system. And I would really like for you to get some points, but if you leave the section blank, you get zero points. So um, we do no longer accept paper application submissions. And this is part of the larger e-grant system for the Commonwealth. So that's why this process is entirely online now. Also, if you have additional attachments, and we'll talk more about what kind of attachments you might be uploading, these will be uploaded directly into the system, and there will be spots indicated in your grant application where you can do that. Um, it will accept 
Word documents, PDF files, uh, JPEGs and pings, um, your normal files that you deal with, Excel files. So um, I wanted to give you just some idea of what the grant system is going to be asking you and how to handle it. And so the application process, if you need help, uh, we have a customer service center and an email address that you can contact. This is for the grant system alone. So if you are having a problem continuing to fill out your grant, something is not working properly, uh, you need to contact the customer service center. There's also a YouTube video that goes through uh, the general application process help online. And you can check that out to see if that maybe covers the issues that you're having. So this is some of the attachments that we would really like that you upload to our grant application system. Um, you'll be asked for letters of support. And if you'll upload those as separate attachments to the system, uh, we'll be asking for CVs and resumes explaining what, or uh, job descriptions if you haven't hired the person yet. You're telling us that you know, hey, we have the qualified individual, or hey, we know what we're looking for, and this is what they'll be doing. Uh, we really wanna see photographs of the materials that you're working on. If you're saying we need to reformat something because it's deteriorating and it's in a horrible condition, we love to see how horrible of a condition that is. It makes us feel better as archivists that we can uh, assist you in, in helping out in this process. Also, you have some very cool, interesting things. And the best way to convince the, the panel who's reviewing your grants to fund you is to share everything you love about this and why you are so excited about your application. And this can include photographs of just documents or unique pictures that you found that you were seeking funding for the larger collection um, to process. We also ask that you upload timelines of what you'll be doing during the two-year grant process, um, your plans and specifications that you'll be using, uh, if you are claiming a nonprofit status, we ask you to upload your IRS verification. This is also where the collaboration agreement that I discussed will be. Um, that'll be an attachment that you upload. It's not a specific um, part of the grant narrative component that you'll be writing about. You'll have to upload the document separately. And also if you have vendor quotes, so you've consulted with an organization ahead of time to figure out how much it was going to be to digitize your 50,000 letters, whatever. Um, that just further gives us uh, a greater idea of how much time you've taken to think about this project. You've gone out and asked for some quotations. Some of you might be buying some stuff from Amazon. I know some of you are in desperate need of things like printers and scanners. Um, those are also documents like cre create a PDF file and upload that for us so that we can see what you're looking at. Um, Things might change over time. I know people have asked for certain equipment purchases. And then uh, between the time that we have announced that you've gotten the grant and then you start the grant, a kind donor has given that to you and you need to re um, look over things. So at least we can see what you were originally planning. So um, you do not have a limit on the number of attachments that you can upload. So fee free, feel free to take advantage of that. And then I have some advice and I want you to think about this. If you've already started, maybe go and, and do these things while you're still thinking about it. And if you haven't started applying for the grant, uh, please put this into your timeline of things to do as well. So one of the things that we would really like to do is have you use your organization's email address instead of a personal one. Um, if you have the ability to do that, because if a grant application is tied to a specific person's email account, and for some reason that person is no longer there, we have no way of contacting you. And also the system will not have that correct information and you might run into issues getting back in because if you successfully get a grant, you'll be using our system um, for some other purposes. So I would suggest creating a username and password in the system and making sure that you write this down and you put it in a shareable place. 
because um, it's very difficult to retrieve this information at a later date if you don't have it. And it's important for grant notifications, for signatures and other important functions during the grant cycle. It's important for um, if you are lucky enough to retire that the person who is taking over the grant has this accessible information. Um, if anybody in your organization is going to change jobs, you cannot predict between when you apply and even when we make the announcement what kind of changes you may undergo. So please record all this information. Um, this is not like the type of security information where we're gonna take it and hack into your accounts and cut off your Netflix. This is so you can get back into the grant application system to sign the contract if you are successful in getting a grant um, to submitting, finding the information about submitting reports and um, other important functions that we'll need you to do throughout the whole cycle. And just keep in the back of your head, I know it's hard to think of this now, it's May and the application is due in August, but if there's any personnel changes, any email address updates that occur after you've submitted your application, notify me so that we can stay in touch with you. We would really like to be able to tell you, you got the grant. But um, if there's changes and we haven't been notified about it, um, it's really hard for us to track you down. So um, keep your information available, make it shareable if necessary, and also update it if it changes. And it could be that your organization's gone to a new system and now you're not a comm, but you're an org. Uh, that email will not reach you if if you do not have that that change in the system. So that's something that you could just email me or contact me about, and I can make the changes for you. And I can also record in other parts of the the grant process um, how we get a hold of you and what's changed. So all right, let's get to the evaluation process. So first. Um, after all the grants have been submitted by 11.59 on August 1st, I will wake up on the 2nd. We will review um, all the grants for eligibility. Also, um, there'll be a panel that is going to be um, constructed from members of the State Historical Records and Archives Board. Did I say that right, Josh? <laughs> All right, I'm bad at acronyms, so I make up things sometimes. Um, so I'm not judging your application and scoring your application, and Josh is not scoring your application, but we have a panel of people so that more um, knowledge and we have more than one opinion on your grant application is available. Um, this panel is going to rank your grants and assign scores for the different sections of, of your grant application. And then the panelists will get together and they'll talk about um, what they reviewed. They'll make comments on your application. And we have the ability sometimes, if you do not get a grant application in this cycle, to share with you uh, what the concerns were or what the reviewers thought. Um, also, if you are successful, you may want to know why you succeeded this time in getting a grant. Um, this is something that takes place, but this will be after you submitted your grant, this will all take place between then and when we make the announcements, the grant have been awarded. So this is a, a just a short list of the evaluation criteria. Uh, there is an example on the website of the exact evaluation criteria and the point system that the panelists will be using. You get 30 points for your project description and there's certain aspects of the project description that you need to have in order to get all 30 points. Um, I'm the kind of person where when I was a professor, if you had everything there, you're gonna get the 30 points. We're not gonna ding you for things and we're not gonna try to take points from you. If you have a work and plan and timetable, you get 12 points and there's certain aspects of that that you must include. Um, you need to list all personnel and consultants on this project and that includes the resumes we were talking about, or maybe the, the person that you are looking to hire, you do not know their name yet, but you, knew, you do know what the requirements for hiring are, or you know what their job is going to be. We also ask that you tell us how you're gonna promote the project. And that's often um, a part of the grant application that, that people forget about. Um, PHMC would really like 
for you to share that hey you received a grant from this organization this this project was funded by phmc and we need to know how you're going to do that you may have a newsletter um, you may even have a formal ribbon cutting i i'm not sure to what level um, you'll be doing that it may be in social media it may be on the web page itself that you're creating you'll be promoting that if, if you leave that blank you're going to lose 10 points and that's already knocked you down to 90 points and sometimes that could be the, the the cutoff for funding in this cycle the other thing i i would like you guys to tell us is um, what is the public or community benefit and what support do you have for your grant application. So who are these materials being digitized for? Who are the researchers that need the content? Or who do you imagine might want to see this content but can't access it now and through this grant have the ability to um, provide it for them? And if as one of your support letters, you can talk, um, have a researcher or someone that you've been working with in the local community who can say, listen, I've worked with them. They've let me in. I've individually have gone through some files and here's why I think this project would be great to support and why more people would find it available online. As we all know, the pandemic kind of shifted all of our worlds into the digital one. And um, there are communities that of, of scholars and researchers and just uh, the general public that we can't even imagine who might be accessing these things, but try to give us some idea who you know would currently be benefiting from this and who you think might. And then also you get um, 14 points for basically spelling out your project budget. We're gonna ask you, how much will you be paying um, for this person for how many hours of work? Um, how many boxes and archival folders do you need? And from where are you buying them? How much is the printer? How much is this or that? Um, and you'll have the uh, space to put in the budget as well as to provide a narrative about the budget and then upload these vendor quotes that I was talking about. Probably the, another important thing is just the overall accuracy, completeness, and merit of your application. So that's 12 points. So did they give us everything that we needed to make a decision on this application? Um, was everything complete? You know, did they give to us all the things we required for the grant? And then is this grant worth funding? Have they proven to us that this grant is worth funding? Um, one of the, the things that I, I want you to keep in the back of your minds about your projects and, and having spoken with people who have not gotten the grant before, this does not mean that your grant is not worth getting the grant money. It just means that your application failed to uh, elicit from the panel the support it needed for the grant. And sometimes I wish uh, we could do this as a, an oral interview process because we can ask the questions we wanna hear. We can talk to you more directly. We can hear the excitement in your voice when you're talking about the materials you're trying to conserve, but you've gotta make sure that you have put everything possible you think we could need into your grant application. And this is what the final 12 points are for. So just a reminder of the timeline, August 1st, 2023. I know it sounds really far away, but I can tell you it's gonna come up quick on you. So the sooner you can get this information in there, the grant system does save your content automatically. So you don't have to do it. Uh, you can go in there and tweak things as you go. Um, we will offer um, grant awards hopefully um, in January of 2024. And the grant project period for this cycle is May 1st, 2024 to May 31, 2026. Once again, this is a two year cycle. Your project may not warrant the full two years. So if you need six months, um, that's all you have to map out in the timeline. But um, these dates, especially award notifications right now are tentative. Sometimes there are other things that take priority. This past year, um, we had the inauguration of a new governor and he had to appoint people and that kind of slowed some things down. And also after your grant has been a, reviewed by the panelists and if you are approved, it has to go through this massive uh, Commonwealth approvement cycle. And uh, that, that takes time that we cannot predict. So hopefully, um, You'll know if you have the grant in January of 24, 
and you'll be able to start it in May of 2024 as well. So let's take another break for questions because these are some uh, more specific things we were talking about. And I wanna make sure that this works. So Josh, thanks for providing that link. Um, does anyone have any other questions? I know this is a lot to think about now, and sometimes until you get into the grant system itself, you probably won't come. I'm here for you to talk to about all of this. I can't emphasize that enough. Um, I'm your I'm your the go-to person for any questions you may have. You may want to ask, like, how should I describe this? It's not um, unknown. I mean, it's something that you're thinking about in your own local situation, and you want to describe it to a larger project community, um, I'm here for you. So anything that you can come up with, anything that obstacles you run into during the grant process, anything that you really hadn't thought about and you realized, oh, wow, I didn't even give that any thought and it's asking me to fill it on the grant application, ask, ask for help. It's, it's not wrong to ask for help. Um, I may be able to provide some advice or ask some colleagues. I could ask Josh, who has the experience in this. Um, we're here for you to, to do the best possible job. I would really like to have a situation where it's really tough for us to decide how we break down and give out all the grants. Um, we've been very lucky at being, being able to grant a lot of applications over the past five cycles. And I, I want yours to be the one that we can just say, wow, yes, amen. This is, this is, let's give them the money. Do we have to talk about this? And uh, that's because you did everything right. And we could tell exactly what you were working on. Um, I will take any additional questions you have. And if there's something that's come up from previous sections right now, feel free to ask it. Um, but I do appreciate all of you being here today. Uh, this is in a better detail on the website. If you want to look over that, and Josh has provided that link in the chat for you, but um, it sounds like a lot. It sounds overwhelming, but it really, when you go to the grant application system, it's asking you to do this in small chunks, and so it's doable. It's semi-humane, and if you kind of work some things out in advance, maybe have parts of this written in a Word document, and you're just pasting things, then you know you're doing this kindly to yourself. I would not suggest doing this all, sitting down to it and trying to do it in all one session of getting it done, unless you're completely and totally and utter, utterly prepared with everything. Natasha, I have one question for you. Yes, um, Scott. So the link that Josh sent there, the digitization guidelines, did you say that includes the uh, what you've just shown us here? Uh, no, that's just the, that's just how to, the, qualifications for what you need to do to digitize something okay sorry okay that's okay i i think you posted at the top like in the more beginning of the chat is the general link to our web page um which is the phmc.pa.gov link and i know some of you are probably a little gun shy about the word digitization and it, I don't want you to feel like that this is this is something that you can't do. You can hire people to do this. We have approved a lot of grants where organizations have outsourced the digitization of their records to a company to do all of these specifications the right way and sending them back to you. It's not too expensive and it's and it's not unusual. Sometimes even with the grant, you don't have the resources to have a person sit there. And sometimes it's a lot easier. You have the continuity of one organization doing it for you. Um, there are some additional resources at the bottom of the grant webpage and that actually list some vendors. There are local vendors in PA. Some of you have already been contacted by some vendors that do this, or you may know another um, nearby organization or group that have done this and you can ask them who they used and it also can be you doing it in-house but um I just want you to to not be afraid of the words digitization because it's all everyone can do this um despite the limited staffing and your own um what you deem your own online skills to be are there any other questions
one more, Natasha, sorry. No problem. Um, so did, did I understand also this grant could be applied for uh, storage, would be obviously for two year period, as far as cloud resources for storage or not? That's a very good question. I think it's something that we can talk about together more specifically, because there's some contracts you have to sign with certain cloud organizations where the content is no longer yours. And I don't, I don't want you guys to kind of get in that situation. This is Commonwealth money we're giving you and we're doing a Commonwealth project, but it might result in that. Um, yeah, it depends. I, I'll just chime in there to, to add to that, Scott. I, I think one of the concerns, at least for the panel, uh, in terms of the panel, so yeah, technically probably going to be eligible, uh, but in terms of, of funding, uh, the likelihood of funding, I guess, um, the panel is going to want to see sustainability for, for long-term purposes. Um, you know, if, if you're looking to host things and, and make them available online, uh, obviously, you know, there's, there's a preservation aspect as well as an access aspect, but uh, for, for the purposes of the panel, I, I think you're going to want to demonstrate uh, that there's some sort of uh, continuity and, and sustainability uh, built into that plan, even if the funding is only for a two-year term. If anyone else has any questions, please feel free to unmic yourself and, and to ask instead of typing it. I appreciate Scott asking these questions because it's probably been on other people's minds and that's what this session is for as well. Hi, yeah, hi, I have a question. I put it in the chat. Thank you, Janet. Let me get down there. Oh yes, so yes, crowdsourcing platforms for transcribing handwritten documents. We have funded a lot of these in the past um, and I think uh, several organizations right now have talked about the success of the companies they've used even for doing this. We we know that these things are not easily read by, let's just say, a current generation of people. And for some of us, um, even who have been taught handwriting, uh, these can be a head scratcher, especially when they've been digitized. So Jan, thank you for bringing that up. There are things that we haven't listed here today that are uh, admissible for this grant. So sending it out and having someone transcribe it or having uh, transcriber come and just uh, if you're doing that for oral histories as well you're transcribing what someone said on a tape and you're making a document out of it um, that works as well but there are a lot of different ways that we can support you making this content available and, and Janet thank you for bringing that up because these are things that um, a lot of you have issues that you need to cover and it doesn't seem like something you can ever do and you want to pull your hair out and just go ah. Oh. And if we're putting it online, it has to be uh, accessible in, in some way. And transcripts are always the best way to, to cover with handwritten documents. I don't know if any of you have ever gone to do research and you realize it was in the German shrift and you can't read it and you just had to get all the copies you could. That was my personal experience. So uh, okay. any other questions? Once again, I want you to feel that you can reach out to me and talk to me about any aspects of this grant that you're considering. Um, I wanna encourage you to share with us the, the cool things that you have that can be made available in Pennsylvania to understanding uh, the, the Commonwealth history and, and society better. Um, some of you probably got projects that you haven't even begun to start or they seem too big for a two year grant cycle. And I would suggest breaking those into phases uh, we have supported organizations more than once to work on projects, um, and you might want to think of this as the pilot project into getting to know what you have and what you can do, um, and and really getting a better grasp on what your collection has, what the collection needs are, including um, conservation and preservation, and what it might need and making it available. Sometimes um, people have submitted grants saying they're going to be able to digitize X amount of records and they're able to do more 
or they're able to do less. So we're not holding you to this kind of standard that, well, you're stupid and you didn't know how much you could do. This is giving you the, the ability. This grant is for people who have uh, maybe not the archival skills or the archival time to do these projects, um, but to get started and making this content available. The state archives, even though we have this brand new beautiful building, cannot house everything possible that everyone wants to access. And we view the HART grant as um, providing a hub so that uh, people can connect and find more content. And we have referred people to collections that have been um, done in the past with a HART grant to researchers who've come into our research room because we've known what has been done. And some people have discovered by digitizing a box of photos that they actually can provide genealogists with information that they've been lacking all this time about a certain area. I also wanna encourage you from um, certain parts of the state who maybe normally wouldn't applica um, submit applications to do so. We, we get a lot of applications from Pittsburgh and Philly areas. Um, and you know, these are the big cities, these people know what they're doing. Um, some of you, there's parts of the state that uh, need this as much as um, anyone. So don't think you're too small or you're too understaffed to apply for this grant, you have archival needs as well. Um, I hope to see a lot of you um, in the future when we give out the grant awards. And I look forward to um, passing on any further information to you I can. So once again, I'm Natasha Margulis, um, my colleague, Josh Stallman. Um, we both can be contacted about the HARD grant with any further questions you may have. And uh, I wish you a good day and we'll be posting this recording on the YouTube page that we provided to you. Thank you everyone and have a great day. Thank you.